All right. Thanks for the introduction, Eric. I'm super excited. Thanks everyone for joining so early in the morning. At least for us, it's early in the morning. My name is Michael, and together with Felix, I'll be we'll be sharing some of our experiences we had while developing an, a tool for automated testing for COBOL. Hopefully, one of the things you'll take away from this presentation today is the uttermost importance of a user-centric approach while developing any kinds of software. And furthermore, the importance of changing and adapting your CI processes. So we want to show you that continuously integrating is possible in, in every environment, at least we think. And this talk is, or th these experiences we had is supposed to be to show you that why we think this. If we switch to the agenda, um, it's supposed to be layouted like these um, old IBM terminals with the catchy name 3270. Um, we'll be firstly giving you a bit of context about COBOL, the mainframes, you know, very short, and then why are we even talking about this? Um, and the next three points will be about our journey of developing this tool, the challenges we faced, and of course, most importantly, our conclusions, our learnings that we had while developing this tool. Now, let's head straight into the context. So, what is a mainframe? A mainframe, mainframes are these large computers. They look a bit like this. And um, they're very robust. So they're basically built to survive earthquakes. And um, basically, that's the last thing that will run in an apocalypse, if you want to say it like that. And um, they're built to be compatible with older systems. So that means, for example, that with new releases of the IBM mainframe, you can still program them with punch cards if you buy the right adapter. Um, unluckily, we didn't find a punch card icon, but this is a floppy disk, so I hope you get the gist. Um, they usually run COBOL programs, which is a business-oriented language. And it's very good for um, depicting or, or showing business cases, but um, it's not very good for complex calculations, which is um, interesting enough. Yes, and now knowing that we are dealing with systems that are compatible with really old systems and are made for business problems, uh, it's time to look more into the business context we found ourselves in. And for us, that meant the client context. And our client is a large insurance company that still had many critical systems running on the mainframe. Um, and as Eric says, those are developed on for more than 20 years. In our case, it was 30 years even that the development was ongoing already. And that meant for the client that the release cycles were for, let's say, modern measures um, still quite big. And we had quarterly releases with six weeks of manual testing every release. And this is already pretty good for mainframe systems that were built in that era. But still, the market is constantly shifting nowadays. As you might have noticed, um, in some cities, all of a sudden, some e-scooters popped up that anyone can just take and ride off with, which uh, was a problem for the insurance industry because they had to adapt their insurance models. And the ones that did this first got all the business. So I, our client also acknowledged that uh, they have to move faster in the market and to do that, they started a transformation towards continuous and agile software development practices. I won't go into too much detail in what that means, but basically you want to continuously integrate your systems and test them, and you want to react fast to re uh, changing requirements on the market. And if we look at one of the most widespread frameworks for agile software development, uh, namely Scrum, um, they basically recommend or the basis on which they build is potentially shippable increments every two weeks, meaning you should be able to release every two weeks um, in a consistent and safe manner. Um, and if you, if you look at the six weeks of manual testing, you might notice a small problem here because we cannot release every two weeks if we need six weeks of testing. And our first task to accomplish those two weeks release cycles was to get that manual testing down. So we were faced with having to write, write uh, automated testing tools for the mainframe. And to decide on how to start with that, we looked at the testing pyramid. For everyone who doesn't know what it is, um, it's basically a layer of your testing layers. And um, the biggest 
One is the base of the pyramid, um, which is then the unit tests, which should give you the fastest feedback and the cheapest feedback. Um, and basically this builds the base of your pyramid, so you need the most of those. So this is how we started. Yeah, so with that being said and this being established, our goal set, we set out to have a conversation with um, senior engineers at our client about, because we didn't have a lot of COBOL experience. Actually, we had none COBOL experience. And we wanted to find something testable, a testable unit in a COBOL program that we could use. So we went out, okay, what's like, what is the smallest possible unit we can find? And with that question, we set out, we asked, okay, what's the smallest possible unit in a COBOL program we can execute on its own? And the answer was, um, they're probably modules. Modules are COBOL programs, single file that you can execute. Said, oh, great, okay. So how large are these normally? They, they, they responded, well, they're about 10,000 lines, but the big ones reach up to 30,000 lines of code. And regarding unit testing, this we, we felt kind of um, taken aback by this. So we didn't give up. We asked, okay, isn't there something smaller? How are these modules structured? And they answered, well, they're divided into sub-programs, which kind of uh, represent the business case if you want to. We said, oh, great, so how big are those? And the answer was, well, in our system, up to 3,000 lines of code. We began to uh, get a bit sad because uh, we wanted unit tests, we wanted smaller units. So again, we didn't give up. So I, okay, there must be something else. And the client responded, well, there are these things called sections which are used to structure a program more and uh, used by developers. I said, oh great, okay, so can we test them on their own, like run them isolated? And the response was no. It's not possible. It's not possible to run them isolated from the rest of the program in order to test them. But we set out to do it anyway, and that's how we got to develop a unit testing framework for COBOL, also called the section test. Yes, and now that we basically get everything we need to motivate a thought worker, basically a complex problem, and a lot of people telling us it's impossible to do, um, we set out to actually writing that unit testing framework, but we had some things that we had to take into consideration before we even started writing it. And the first thing was we could not or did not want to do it in COBOL uh, for two reasons. First, the programming language um, was not known to us, so it would have actually taken a lot of time to get into writing COBOL. And the second reason was that um, it's also an older language and it doesn't have like a lot of the convenience tools and most importantly for us, no unit testing functionality uh, that we could test our framework with. And the second one was we wanted to have a domain specific language, a short DSL, which our users then could use to describe their test cases in a manner that was suitable to them. Meaning uh, as COBOL developers, they had a certain expectations on how to describe um, yeah, basically anything they want to do with their code. And that might differ from uh, what we as, let's say Java developers, um, experience in our testing experience. And those two together then lead us to the third one, which is we had to come up, come up with a grammar for our testing language. And we also needed to not only pass that testing language, we also needed to pass the COBOL code because since we're not using COBOL, we did not run in a COBOL environment. And that was actually a bit of a more complex problem, but we will come to that later. And last but not least, uh, we did not only want to run on the mainframe. And as uh, Eric already mentioned, um, it is quite expensive to actually run stuff on the mainframe because you pay per CPU cycle. So writing one thousands or maybe millions of unit tests and running them every commit on the mainframe is probably not the best idea from a business perspective. So we had to come up with an alternative plan. And then what we came up with is that our users should describe the test cases in our testing language that we would come up with. We would then have our tool pass those te uh, test descriptions and the corresponding source code to generate a so-called test driver. Uh, in our case, this was just a COBOL program that we then could compile and execute. It would execute the section and then validate the uh, um, test expectations that we had. 
Another thing that we wanted, because we did not only want to run on the mainframe, we wanted it to be able to run on any machine, basically. And we achieved that by using the GNU COBOL compiler, which is an open source COBOL compiler. It can compile COBOL to run on, I think, any operating system, but we used Linux and containerized that with a Docker container, meaning we could run basically anywhere where we could access Docker. And that meant we were also able to execute it on central CI servers or even cloud services like Eric mentioned um, before. And that left us with a problem because we were basically testing in a completely different environment than the code was actually running in. And to sort of mitigate that problem, we wanted to have a replay functionality so that we could once a day, once a week, whatever our client deemed um, feasible, come back to the mainframe and actually execute the tests there again. And now that you have an idea of what we try to do uh, with our testing framework, it's time to look into what we actually wanted to test. Yeah, so in order to, for you to understand um, the challenges we faced and what we're actually talking about a bit better, you will have to learn a bit of COBOL. But no worries, it's very easy and we'll take you through a very small example. So we're going to take you through an example module, actually. So if you remember, those, all, those are the COBOL programs. So a COBOL program is normally divided into three parts. The first one being the identification division. Here, you can specify different program metadata. The only mandatory thing you have to specify here is a name for your program. So in this case, it's my program. And the second part is the data division. And as, as you can probably figure out from the name, it, this is where your data goes. So you can define and declare your variables over here. And the last part, main part of um, a COBOL program is the procedure division, which is sort of like the main function from that you know from other languages like Java, for example. This is basically your entry point to the COBOL program. Now, some other things to highlight is number four over here. This is where a section is called. So this is kind of like calling a function in other programming languages. And number five is the very definition of this section. And what this program does basically uh, isn't a lot. It's a hello world. And it accepts two user inputs, preferably numbers. Then it runs into the section and adds these two numbers together and prints the result. Very simple. So if we have a closer look at this section number five, which adds the two numbers and displays the result, and we want to test that isolated from the rest of the program. So as Felix mentioned before, we are building the test driver. And for this section to be able to run on its own, of course, we need to figure out what are these variables? What are the types of them? And as you've seen before, we can simply look in the data division and parse the original program and see what type are these variables. The problem is they can be specified or declared in different parts of this data division. So for one, we have the working stored section. Then we also have the linkit section. The linkit section is kind of a parameter list for when your program is being called. You can call it with uh, certain values and in order to use this, these values in your program, you can specify them in the linkage section. And last but not least, variables can also be external. So they can come from an entirely different program. Luckily for us, they have to be declared in, um, in the actual module we're currently working in. So if we have a look at it a more abstract way and we want to test a simple section in our module. Now, to look for our variables that we need, it's probably, it's very easy. They're probably declared somewhere in the module. However, we mentioned sub-programs before. So let's say we want to test a section in the sub-program. In order to um, get our variables, right, the definitions, we, they can either be declared in the module or in the sub-program itself. So we have to look in two places. And again, if they're external, they're not really declared there, but they're at least listed there, so we can infer the type from there. Now, luckily for us, we found a very cool open source tool, a uh, open source COBOL parser, which um, gives you an abstract syntax tree uh, of a program, a module, 
and lets you traverse through this uh, abstract syntax tree. For you, for you, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's an abstract syntax tree is kind of a, a way of destructuring code and looking at the uh, elements of your program. Yes, and now that we sort of solved this problem, uh, not in every detail, but we at least had something running and we could extract code from a section and put it in our test drivers and run it. We set out and did a pretty scary thing at the time, which was actually talking to our users and getting some feedback on our tool. And the first thing that came back to us was that basically not everyone in the room understood what we were trying to tell them with our testing language, um, which yeah, was a big problem for us because our assumption of what that testing language should look like came from the Java, Kotlin, or whatever other programming language world, um, but not from the COBOL world. So we actually figured out that, for example, there's no assert statement in, in COBOL that looks like this, but there's an expect statement. So we had an, yeah, we changed our assertion language to an expect language, uh, which was then more COBOL near. And also the description of the test cases themselves and then how to configure your variables, it was all not exactly how our users wanted it to look like. And we will give a small example of um, how we solve one case for the testing description for that. Um, but once we figured out what our users actually understood for a testing language, they also started to try to play around a bit with the examples that we gave them and were able to get some pretty sketchy error messages that kind of looked like this. And looking at those, you might notice that they all have something in common and they're basically not giving you any hint on to how to solve your problem. And the case was the same for us because as we mentioned earlier, we were extracting a section and putting it in another program. And now you might know that for compile errors, for example, it's really useful to know which line actually caused that compile error, but we did not have any line mappings from the original source code to our test driver. So if the compile error um, happened while compiling our test driver, we actually at that moment did not have a way to tell the user where in the original source code the compile error was happening. And we were quite scared by this because solving that problem would have been a whole lot of implementation work that could get really complex until one of our users made a comment and she, uh, she just proposed that we print the three lines before the compile error, the line itself and the three lines after the compile error because with the normal search functionalities in IDEs, you would then be able to find the spot where your compiler error was happening. So actually talking to our users in that case gave us a way more pragmatic approach to this. Um, and once we implement this, we started seeing where our compiled errors were coming from and noticed that we missed a pretty big part of the isolation of a section. Yes, thanks for the segue, Felix. So a thing we realized now that we had these or more or less decent error messages and we knew where to look for our, for why our tests weren't compiling properly. We saw, hey, we need a way to mock sections and programs. So let's look at our section from before, the example section that adds two numbers and prints the result. Um, so let's say the section is called, but before it does the, the calculation and the printing, it it calls another section. It performs something that, a section that prepares something maybe. Or afterwards, it calls an entirely different program or sub-program that does some cleaning, uh, cleanup. So we implemented a way um, for users to mock uh, both sections and programs. But a thing we realized when testing out these functionalities together with users we noticed that for a specific business case that we want to test, and remember, COBOL modules are large and the sections are also very large, a lot of lines of code. We noticed that for a specific business case that we want to test, so a path that has gone through in our code, a lot of sections that are called in the section we are testing for this specific business case are not called, they're not touched. So, for you to write a test for this section, you would have to mock like 20 or 30 sections or programs that you weren't actually um, caring about in your test case. So we added something, um, we added an include functionality, which allowed users to simply include sections and programs that were not relevant for the um, actual business case they were testing. 
moving on, this is sort of how the, um, the mocking looked like in our tool. It's not 100% accurate though. So we have kind of a, um, a mock section keywords and then the name of the section you want to mock. This works uh, for programs as well. And it's enclosed by the end mock um, keyword. And in the middle, you have kind of a um, enclosed by two COBOL tags. You have a space where you can write actual COBOL code and um, configure your mocking behavior of the section. Now, what's interesting here is you can see you can really see this tool is a tool for COBOL developers because the syntax, our DSL, is very um, close to actual COBOL. And um, yeah, and of course, in the middle, you can write actual COBOL. Now, we set out to do another scary thing. We were actually really excited. We wanted to test, we wanted to write section tests, unit tests for in production code for these huge modules that we were talking about earlier. So we hacked away some test cases in our DSO. We inputted them into our tool and we hit the go button. And we waited a bit and we waited a bit longer and even more and a bit longer. And we noticed, okay, our tool is taking far too long. And this is not what we wanted at all. We wanted the fast feedback loop um, the fast and cheap feedback loop, but we weren't getting it. So why is this? Um, something we had kind of forgotten was that we still need to parse the original entire COBOL program. So these 30,000 lines of code, they don't simply go away. Now we solved this issue, but presenting the fix to you here today wouldn't um, further the message we're trying to give you in this talk, but we're happy to talk about it in the chat anyways. Yes, and now that you have heard more of the problems that you commonly face in, in software projects, talking to users, some performance issues, getting it to run at all, I want to share one example of you where our environment was causing us some problems um, that we did not expect. And it all started with those things. Um, Michael mentioned them earlier. This is an IBM punch card. And as you might see, this is pretty fixed in the line length. So if you're not really good at stone masonry, masonry, you cannot really change how long a line is here. And that led to the COBOL version that the IBM mainframe was running, or that uh, at least the program we were interacting with was written in, uh, to also have a fixed line length. And at one time, a colleague of us was screaming across the whole floor, um, F in punch cards. And we were kind of wondering what was happening. And Basically, as we've told before, we were generating this test driver. And while just inputting some messages that our tool should, uh, should send out, uh, he went above the threshold of the 80 characters you had per line. And what happened then, that after a week of programming this and testing it on our Linux machines, he actually ran it on a mainframe. And the compiler basically said, oh, nope, this is not happening. We are not going to allow you to yeah, write lines that are longer than 80 characters of code. So we again had to implement a more complex log logic to make sure that we not only don't go over the line limit, but also that we um, switch to the next line in the correct way. For example, if you're writing a string and you want to continue it in the next line, we also have to take care of that, which was good for learning COBOL, but, uh, COBOL, but uh, yeah, not so nice for us in trying to figure out what was happening. And now that we've talked about the problems we faced a lot, uh, we come to our part where we want to share our experiences and, and what we learned from that. So the conclusions part. And the biggest thing basically that we figured out, well, out was to early on use a user-centric approach. Because um, yeah, the first thing we learned was that our expectation of what a unit test should look like for a COBOL uh, program was not at all what our users really needed. And if we just talk to them in the beginning a bit more, we might have had this learning a bit earlier. And it could have saved us a lot of work in rewriting that language. And after we learned this, we kind of switched approaches a bit. And we built incre uh, increments with even smaller changes. And with an increment, I don't necessarily mean only software here. We also had cases where we just wrote down some versions of the testing syntax we could uh, imagine and went to some users and just asked them for feedback. How would you describe this? Is version one the best one, version two or version three? And as soon as we got that user feedback, we came back and um, changed stuff. 
And on a bigger scale, that is then the software scale again with those increments on a software level, we actively tested then in user workshops. So we got more direct feedback than just asking our users to do something. And it was more interactive. And we also tried writing tests with that framework for production code ourselves, which was then again even more learning for us. And the last step, and this is the most important step, we actually learned from it and adapted to that user feedback. Um, what do I mean by most important step? Uh, please don't put your user feedback in some confluence page where no one is ever going to look at it again. Actually take it into account and yeah, adapt to that feedback. Uh, your users will be really thankful for that and actually feel like they can influence things. And if you look at those three bullet points, we came up with this sort of circular process where we always build something, collect user feedback on it, and learn from that feedback. And if you are interested in this topic and want to learn a bit more about it, we will share some links afterwards. And one of the links will be for Jess Humboldt's uh, Lean Enterprise, where he describes this process for larger scale and um, more user-facing software um, development processes. Mm -hmm. So with that, we come to the second thing we learned, and that is the answer to the question, how accurate do we really need to be? And in order to, to answer this question and for you to actually understand this question a bit better, we're going to look at an issue we faced uh, a while back while developing this tool. So as mentioned before, we had discrepancies between the environment we were um, testing our COBOL code and the environment that was actually used for production code. So we were um, compiling our tests with the GNU COBOL compiler, running them locally, as opposed to compiling with the IBM compiler and then running them on the mainframe. And as you can imagine, that probably gives us a couple of issues. One of these issues was ambiguous referencing. Now, the problem that we had while developing with um, on our setup was that we found that pr production code had various um, or a lot of variables with the same name in one file, but defined in different namespaces. And in these files, the variables were referenced without specifying the actual namespace. So this is ambiguous referencing, right? And the IBM compiler didn't catch this. So it just ignored it and simply took the first uh, reference it found and went along with that. And now you can probably see how this can be a bit of a, um, an issue when trying to figure out why your code isn't working properly or the way you intend it to, to work. And um, the GNU COBOL compiler that we were using didn't put up with this kind of behavior. So it went it straight, it directly threw an error saying that this is ambiguous referencing, please fix it. And it was interesting because um, we then got, when we showcased this issue to um, the client and the, the engineers at our client, we got this quote here, please do not fix this compiler issue. This is a programming error that the IBM compiler does not catch currently. So we weren't supposed to fix this issue because our tool was actually forcing the COBOL developers at our client to write cleaner code because not referencing your variable correctly without a namespace is actually considered not clean code in the COBOL community. So this was interesting. And this leads us back to our question, how accurate do we really need to be when, um, when we're testing with our tool? And the obvious answer now, I think, is actually not 100% accurate. So it's really important to look at the trade-off that we have. Because of the different environment that we set up, we got a much faster and cheaper feedback loop that we could execute multiple times, um, 100 times a day if we wanted to, and we didn't actually, it wasn't as expensive as running on a mainframe. So we say actually having the trade-off of not being 100% accurate, maybe 97%. And if you know of the issues, that's really important, as long as you get a fast feedback loop. Yes, and now acknowledging and knowing that we were not 100% accurate, um, I want to take you back on what we actually set out to do. And this was, as Michael mentioned, fast feedback, but please not too expensive, so don't run any test at every point uh, on the mainframe, uh, because we still have a business to run. And what we set out to do and then accomplished was we had a 
domain-specific language, like a testing syntax for our users to describe tests for COBOL in a way that a COBOL developer understands. We then had our program pass those testing descriptions and the corresponding source code in a suitable amount of time to still call it fast feedback. Disclaimer here, we were not as fast as JUnit, for example, but we were still, enough to, uh, still fast enough to have fast feedback during your development uh, cycle and even do TDD if you wanted to. And from that, we could then generate a test driver. And by using the um, new COBOL compiler and Docker, basically, we were able to also run it on any machine, meaning also central CI server. So we could integrate it in CI processes um, if we could react to those uh, code commits uh, on the mainframe in any way. And as Michael mentioned, we were not 100% accurate. And we shared an example where we also uh, where we were more correct than the IBM COBOL compiler. And we also had some cases where it was not as clear cut, for example, how to convert a string to a number and what is allowed there and what is not. And it was just two opinions on one specifications, let's put it like that. So it was not always clear that the IBM compiler was, ro compiler was wrong or we were wrong, but it was still something we had to take into account. And of course, we did not know of all the differences in the beginning, so we had to make sure that the code was actually just compilable on the mainframe, not even talking about running. So for that, we had this uh, replay functionality then. So we basically had one implementation that was able to also compile it on the mainframe. And that enabled us to once a day, once a week, or however you want to configure it, to also execute those unit tests on the mainframe again to make sure that everything is working as in production. And if we look at the line after the uh, executing it anywhere and, and then looking at the replay button, Basically, this is a two-step CI process. Um, so you have this one gate where you're doing CI all the time on Linux machines in the cloud or wherever you want to do it. And then once this gate is passed, after some time, uh, you then go to the more expensive environment and do your CI testing again. So what does this actually look like in a bigger context? For that, um, if you're interested in that, I would send you to the HP case study. We will also share a link uh, to that with you where HP transformed their Epson printer line and how they developed drivers there to a CI or even CD approach. And we will also share a link where Jess Humble and Gary Groover, who was the VP of engineering at the time at HP, uh, talk about the uh, common learnings they had with Lean Enterprise and the HP case study. And with that, we are through with our talk. We thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. And if you still have any questions, uh, please ask them in the Q&A section now. We're happy to answer them live. And afterwards, please join us in our Slack channel and ask any questions you have there. Okay, yeah, thank you for a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. There are two questions in the um, Q&A channel on Zoom. Just as a brief note, I'll mention it again later. Please do not use the raise hand function. We can't really do this in the Zoom setting. Please ask the question in the Q&A function. So the first question that, let's, that we should answer live is, how were you able to run the tests on Linux as well as the mainframe with one tool? OK, um, I think I'm going to take this one. So um, the IBM mainframe has a separate system that um, was introduced later than the, the normal runtime environment where you execute COBOL, for example. That's called the uh, Unix subsystem. So basically, you have one part of the COBOL system, uh, of, the, of the mainframe system. It can still, for example, compile COBOL from there, but you can also uh, run Java, for example. And how our tool worked was basically that one client that was sort of responsible for parsing uh, and displaying the test results. And we had a server sort of that we sent the test driver to and that server would then compile it and run it. And as you can imagine, you could just switch on, switch how in each environment you would compile and run your code. So one time we would call the new COBOL compiler that was packaged in a Docker container. And the other time we would just um, call the pre-configured IBM compiler and run it from there. Okay, I'll mark this as answered. The uh, next one is, how did you solve the performance issue regarding passing of bigger COBOL programs? Felix, can you please take this one? <laughs> OK. Um, so the, the performance issue, as you mentioned, was caused by still having to pass this huge 
huge COBOL programs. And what we did was um, basically figure out on a line by line basis, which is pretty hard as you might imagine, um, and using a stack internally, I won't go into more details because this is really another talk in itself. Um, we were able to then figure out which section do we want to test and which of the program definitions, as in the working storage, linkage section, and stuff like that, were really relevant to our test execution. So we would look at the section, see which context it is in, and take the variable definitions from all the context above it. And uh, so we had all the program definitions, but none of the code that we did not want to test. So basically, we looked at the program, looked if we wanted to include certain sections, for example, and we also kept those kept our section on a test, and other than that, just variable, uh, variable definitions, which uh, then meant that the actual creation of that syntax tree that Michael mentioned uh, was going a lot faster, because we just did not have as many lines of code anymore and no comments and stuff like that. Cool. So the next one, how many, yeah, I said there were two. There's new questions coming in. Um, how many unit tests did you, did you write in total? And how long did the suit take to run? Um, like in, in total, uh, it's a bit hard to say, but um, we weren't there to actually write tests for the existing, um, the existing, uh, existing system that was already in production. We were there to enable developers um, from the client side to write these tests and maybe even adapt a um, test-driven approach if they want to. Um, we did certain user um, workshops where people could kind of learn about the tool in order to encourage them. Um, but concrete numbers, we do not have. We just know it's, um, it's a lot faster than running them on the mainframe. Yeah, so maybe to expand on this, um, the whole test read is really hard to say for us because um, yeah, basically we only had certain example programs. So we wanted to make sure that we can test UI programs, for example, we can test business logic programs, and we can programs that are accessing the database. And for each error we found in our tool, then we had one case that we just um, took into our test suites, uh, which meant that we had about, I think it was 30 or 40 programs that we were testing there. And yeah, this was running in about, I think, 12 minutes. So I, I would assume for a huge COBOL program, it would take about half a minute to a minute of per section. But that's just a guess on, on the average of, of the test to learning. Cool. The next one. Do you have plans for open sourcing the test framework? <laughs> uh, I didn't make this up, even though I asked this myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we were planning on doing it um, for sure, because it's a really interesting tool. And I think it's really valuable for the community as well. Um, the thing is, it's owned by our client. As Eric mentioned, we're a consultancy working for other companies. Um, so we don't own that, pro, uh, that, that tool. Um, but I know that for sure there were discussions at the client and a lot of preferences uh, from teams that it would be open sourced. But I don't know the current status of that discussion. There was also something, uh, there was a mention of a unit testing framework by IBM in the Slack channel. So maybe you can check that out later as well. I think we actually had a look at that. And I think one of the reasons we um, discarded that option was because it was, it was written in COBOL and it, again, runs on the mainframe, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think we looked at a couple of tools. So um, we did not write something that was not there before at all. Um, the thing is, there was um, one company who was selling a version of this. Um, and the test descriptions were just not really suitable and it only worked with the running mainframe in the back. So that was basically why we said this is not feasible for us. And the other one was an open source tool that was written in COBOL, but it did not support all the cases that we needed. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning, none of, us, none of us knew COBOL, so it was even hard to figure out what they were doing at all in there. Um, so this is why we set out to, to developing our own version of it. So here's another one. What was the frequency of releases you achieved after the testing tool was introduced? Um, and yeah, as, as Michael mentioned already, we were not really um, tasked with uh, yeah, writing unit tests there. Um, quick disclaimer here, this is still an ongoing process at that client, because as you can imagine, um, if you have 30 years 
of software development on, on one part of the software, it's quite large. Um, and writing unit tests for all of this and actually getting to a point where you feel confident enough to release every month um, without manual testing, um, that takes time. So it's still an ongoing process to even get the releases shorter. Um, but yeah, what, what we showed by this was and what we talk, wanted to show in this talk, um, it would be possible to do CI um, with a mainframe easily. Um, the thing is, you have to first get the test coverage. So um, you might know it from other programs, big Java monolith, for example, um, if it doesn't have any unit tests and you want to do CI, it takes a lot of time to get it there. And it's a bigger project. So this is where our client is currently at. So Santiago asks, can you shed more light on the test driver side? Did you use something already built or created something in-house? Um, so I think the interesting part here is that we didn't use anything except for the COBOL parsing library that we mentioned before, which is open source, and we can also share the link for that. Our tool, the, the main function of our tool was to create this test driver. And what this test driver basically is, is just a COBOL program, which um, has the section, the variables, your mocks and includes, and it has the functionality of asserting these, uh, of, of performing the assertions that you write up in your DSL. So the, the test driver is actually just something that our tool creates and is nothing more than a COBOL program. Yes, and maybe to expand on that, like one thing that we did, that we learned also um, was that when we were generating this um, test driver, we had to wrap our code execution in a separate sub-program, um, just to share one of the issues that we faced. Um, because it is possible in COBOL to terminate the execution of your current program. And if you don't wrap your code into a sub-program, then just your test driver will stop working when the section calls this part of the, the code. Yes. Um, I see some chat. I think it's time for a break. Is that correct, Eric? No, there's not going to be a break. We're going to head straight into the next talk in three minutes. So. We'll see how far we can get through the questions in the next three minutes, and then we'll do the talk. After the next talk, there's going to be a 15-minute break. So it's quite um, timely. There's two more questions. There don't seem to be more appearing. Maybe you can do them in three minutes. First one is curious about what level of automation there was in the existing six weeks testing processes. Was it completely manual? Um, no, it was not. So um, there were some automated tests um, that were run in a, I, I think they called it automated um, case worker or something like that. Um, that basically was a huge Excel macro where you could um, just yeah, describe your test cases in Excel cells. And then it would just connect to the mainframe and use this 3270 interface that uh, our agenda kind of looked like. Um, and just execute commands from the UI. Um, so all the automated testing that was there uh, was done via the UI and needed an integrated environment already. And with the releases that you normally have on a mainframe, getting to that integration part um, was actually the hard part. So you had all your developers developing in something, but you had to put it in one testing environment to run your um, semi-automated tests, I would call them. Um, which actually then led to a six-week uh, testing process. Um, and all the new features that were already uh, developed um, still would have manual testing. And yeah, so it was not fully manual, but mostly manual. Yeah, and maybe also to add to that, in order to rerun your test, you would have to kind of um, redo the changes to databases and stuff like that. So you actually had to do manual work in order to run these um, semi-automatic tests to be able to rerun your tests and always have kind of the more or less the same environment. Cool. And then last question. Will you be looking into mutation testing tools, looking forward to the agenda, if there aren't any yet? 30 seconds. Um, I, I will answer this quickly. We are both not at that client anymore. Um, I am currently looking into this for our current project, but then more on the Kotlin side of things and not for mainframe. Um, but I think some of our colleagues that are currently still at the client will also be in the Slack channel. I at least know of the current tech lead that is joining the XCOM, so maybe he can shed some light on what's going on there right now. Mm -hmm.